Hello? All right. We are ready now. Any questions for me? Yep. No idea. Okay. Right. I, I will show you an example okay. right now. Uh, I anticipated that would be a yeah. problem. So, uh, how to basically extend the idea from one differential equation to two differential equations okay. in MATLAB? That's what I need to demonstrate today. Okay. How do you find the assignment? Okay, so you need to help me. You need to tell me, and uh, particularly when I'm demonstrating, I will try to demonstrate MATLAB as much as possible in the class, and I'm recording it so that you can go and see it again. And uh, if I throw any word or any concept that doesn't make sense, or you see something there and you don't understand it in a program, please stop me right there because I can explain it and hopefully that will uh, make it better. But no substitute for actually doing it. Okay. So if there is a need as we go down, maybe we can have the classes uh, in the lab next door. So rather than demonstrating it, you can actually do it yourself. It may be useful once we get into Simulink. You know, we're putting control box together, and uh, so it will be useful for you to do it as soon as I do it. I guess. Okay. So I realize that MATLAB is uh, not uh, everybody's favorite, <laughs> but it is a very powerful program. Even if you hate it, I hope you will agree that it's a good program <laughs> to uh, the end of the course. That. Um, and once you go into industry, MATLAB is very uh, frequently used in control groups. If you join a control, control group, uh, it will be used there. OK, so any other questions or comments? I did manage to put the notes last night by 9 o'clock, not 8 o'clock, I think. Um, I will try to maintain that. Okay. Um, the last lecture, uh, Is everything okay for you? Do you want to? Okay. So we look at, at developing a dynamic model from first principles by applying conservation of energy to a very simple problem. It's a problem with a single ordinary differential equation. And the problem is um, one where you have uh, water coming in and leaving at the same rate, at the same rate, but the temperature is being changed by adding heat. So we came up with this particular differential equation, uh, which says on the left hand side the rate of accumulation of energy, which is this term, is equal to rate in minus rate out. Then you express that. Okay? And this part is the control part. So which should automatically go to zero. Now the terminology here is T is the temperature in the tank. T R is the desired set point that I would like to achieve. I'd like to bring T to TR. Okay? And when that happens, of course, the control action should drop out. Okay, when T is equal to TR. Another way of dropping the control action is to turn the controller completely off, which means setting KC equal to zero. So either one of them will take the last term out. T equal to TR or KC equal to zero. Now, when that happens, and when you have a steady state, the left hand side should also be equal to zero. Okay? So the left hand side drops out, this drops out, and this steady state condition or if there is no control okay, in the combination. Then what you get is the steady state heat input that you need to increase the temperature from Ti to T. But T is equal to Tr when it reaches the steady state at that point. Okay? So, uh, that, so the steady state model is built into the dynamic model. And then we said, OK, we can rearrange it. We didn't really see how to solve it. Uh, we will do it later on using the plus transform, okay, which will be much more easier way of solving it. But I've just given you the solution to point out certain features in the solution. And what are the features? The features that we saw are as t goes to infinity, it does reach a steady state because the time appears only here. As t goes to infinity, e to the power minus that term 
drops to zero, and you get the actual temperature in the tank as Tr, the set point, plus the sun. Okay. So we then we said, okay, let's solve the same problem in MATLAB numerically, not analytically, but numerically, by rewriting this equation once again, this equation in the following form, where all I have done is I have kept dt, the temperature of perspective time on the left-hand side, moved everything else to the right-hand side. So I have divided the whole right-hand side by rho vc, and I call that as my function f. This is what you will also do in your assignment. You will have two differential equations, so you will call them f1 and f2. Keep on the left-hand side only the derivative term. Everything else goes to the right-hand side. That defines your function for MATLAB to use and integrate and get the temperature or the height in your case. And this is, as you see, nothing but the same term, except it is divided by rho bc. And we said, OK, I'm going to take this function and put it into MATLAB, write a small MATLAB program, which I'm going to use together with an ODE integrator, a differential equation solver. Okay. And uh, let me start MATLAB. And uh, I want to go through MATLAB uh, in a bit more detail, particularly because many people are new to it. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I need to do is change the path to the place where the files are. Okay, so here I have uh, the H tank. Okay. What I wanted you to do is, I don't know, have you done it? Compare and try to understand what this program does. Okay, So all we are doing is setting all the values. The flow rate is 10 kilograms per second. The heat capacity of the medium water, for example, is 1,000 joules per kilogram degree C. The inlet is coming at 45 degrees C. And I would like it to go out at 80 degrees C. So I'm setting the target uh, set point at 80 degrees C. And I'm setting the density of the water, 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. B, the volume of the tank, is 1,000 meter cube. And here, I have set my heater such that it puts out 550,000 joules per second. Okay. And uh, the last line is my control action. Okay. So first, I'm going to put that as 0. So there is no control action. And I want to see, I need to save this. Because when MATLAB executes this, if you make change and then run it, it's not going to work. You need to save that file uh, onto the directory. And then when MATLAB runs it, it's going to uh, use this to get you the solution. The next function I want to open up is uh, the driver that calls this particular function. So it has two functions. And the way that they interact is the following. EG1.m is the file that calls the differential equation solver. It's called ODE45. And it tells the differential equation solver program, solve me the solution to this particular function. That defines the problem. Okay? And so it integrate from 0 to 20,000 seconds and use the uh, initial temperature in the tank as 80 degrees. Okay. And options sets the options for the ODE integrator, the solver, which says, get me a solution that is accurate to 10 to the minus 6, six significant digits, and output the function to a plotter so that I can look at graphically how the temperature, the output is the temperature, and this is the time, how the temperature versus time plot looks like. Any questions on any part of this? OK, so I, um, let me run this. We have done this in the last class, but here is the graph. The graph is automatically generated simply because I set the ODE output option as ODE plot. If I didn't do that, what I will have in my workspace would be just two variables. Um, let me just set the desktop layout to default so that I can see the workspace also. So in the, in the workspace, you see the two new variables are created, lowercase t, which is the time step at which the integrator has returned the solution, and t is the temperature. So if I double click on that, I get an array. These are all the temperatures at which, the times at which I have the temperature as a solution. Okay. 
So this is basically an array editor which allows you to look at the values or edit the values. Again, if I'm going fast, you need to stop me, okay? And uh, this is the actual solution. The temperature at the various times. You can go down and see all the rings. Okay? And the graph is basically a graphical representation of these two plots. Now the question that you need to ask is, does it make sense? What I'm getting is the inlet temperature, the, the initial temperature in the tank is 80 degrees. The initial temperature is 80 degrees. And uh, the inlet temperature is uh, 45 degrees. Pi, the inlet temperature is 45 degrees. And my set point is also 80 degrees. I want the controller to bring back the temperature to 80 degrees. Okay. Now, what I'm getting when there is no control action, in this simulation there is no control action, what I'm getting is it goes to 100 degrees. Okay. So coming in at 45 degrees, initially the tank water is at 80 degrees, and I'm putting a certain amount of heat, 550,000 uh, joules per second, and it increases the outlet temperature to 100 degrees. Does this make sense? To answer that question, all you need to do is go back to this equation. Okay, um, under steady state, the left hand side is equal to zero, and T is, uh, the KT is zero in this case. There is no control action. So, what is the equation? The remaining equation is zero equals WC TI minus T plus QS. So, in this equation, we have set W, we have set C, we have set TI, we have set QS. So, what should T be? You can solve for it. Right? So this is 10 and this is uh, 1,000, so that gives you 10,000. Multiplied by Ti is 45 degrees minus something plus 550,000. Should be equal to zero. So MATLAB is basically going to follow a particular system under steady state condition. So the final temperature that you see should be consistent with this equation. Is it? Okay, you cancel the four zeros there you are left with 55. So take the temperature to the other side, and what you get there is T is equal to 45 plus 55, which is 100 degrees. So when there is no control action, if you are putting that much heat, 555,000 joules per second, and the inlet is coming at 45, it is going to go out at 100 degrees. Now we want to invoke the control action and see whether the controller can bring down the temperature from 100 degrees, uncontrolled condition, to 80 degrees. And this is what I think we were started doing in the last class, and I probably didn't explain it very well. So I'm going to put some number. So let me put a number of uh, what they have used, I guess, in the book is W times C, but it doesn't have to be. You can choose any number. Controller, design, you choose this uh, constant KC. So let me just pick, uh, say, 5,000. I save it, and I'm going to do one thing here, and these are aspects of MATLAB that you can learn as you go on, okay? If you enter the command hold, what it's going to do is, it's going to keep the current plot, and then add the next graph, next line onto the graph. Otherwise, it'll write out the graph and produce a new one. So onto this graph, I want to keep this so that I can compare the effect of control action. So I just enter the command hold, which says, okay, I'm holding the plot, and if you keep any additional graph, it's going to add to that. Okay. So I go back to this function, the driver, and I run it one more time. But this time, when I run this, it's going to use the same function h tank, but the controller parameter is changed. Okay. So what is happening here? The temperature has come down from 100 degrees, but it has not brought it to 80 degrees. This is what we wanted. Okay. And what you will learn is, it is very difficult to get it back to 80 degrees with only proportional action. Why? You can answer that question why by simply looking at this is an analytical solution help. Okay? So if you look at the analytical solution, you find that T goes to infinity, this term drops up. Plus you have TR plus this number. The only way you can make it this number go to zero is if you make KT equal to so we need infinitely large gain to drive it back to the set point. And this is what we call the offset, offset from the set point. Proportional controllers always have that offset. Okay, that's a disadvantage of it. Now, an integral action will 
drive that to zero because the error is integrated and then driven to zero. Okay, so we will see how to do that uh, uh, later on. But right now, I think you get the idea of uh, how to reduce the uh, uh, offset, how to drive it closer. So just keep on increasing this, maybe fifty thousand. Oops, I need to run this program. Okay, so it's a gain of 50,000, you're now able to bring it almost to 83 degrees or so. But that is the steady state value. Okay, uh, for each gain, there is a steady state uh, temperature that is reached. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let me take a digression from here and show how to handle two equations, okay, so that you, you, you are prepared to do the assignment. And then we'll come back to this particular problem, continue on that. Now, the problem I'm going to talk about, let me just open that file also. Uh, this is not the problem that you're doing, but it's a set of uh, two ordinary differential equations. So the equation that you are solving here is something like this, dy1 dt, that's the first differential equation. But these other differential equations are always going to be in this form. d dt of something equals a function. So here I'm going to call this function f1, and that function is going to be minus y1 minus y2 y1 plus k epsilon y2. And then the second equation is dy2 dt equals the next function f2, which is y1, actually there is an epsilon there, y1 minus y1 y2 minus epsilon k y2. These are the two equations. And the initial conditions for this problem, we always have to be given an initial condition. So the initial condition is y1 at t equal to 0 is, uh, let's just make it up 1 y2 at t equal to 0 is 0. Okay. So there are a set of two ordinary differential equations and two sets of initial conditions, one for each variable. So there are two unknowns, y1 and y2. Now, if I give you this model, can you say something about the character of this model? Is it a nonlinear problem or a linear problem? You, do you know what I mean by that? Do you know how to understand, how to Identify whether a problem is linear or nonlinear. Right. You, you need to look for power of the unknown variable. So in here, in this particular model, k is a parameter, a constant, a known value. Epsilon is a parameter. T is an independent variable, time. And y1 and y2 are the dependent variables. So when we are talking about a solution to this problem, we are talking about graph like this, y1 versus t, y2 versus t. Okay, so we're going to generate some graph like that, starting from some initial condition. That curve, when it plugged into this differential equation, must satisfy the differential equation. Okay? That's what we mean by the solution. So y1 and y2 are the unknowns. That's the first thing that you need to identify in a problem. What am I solving for? What are the unknowns? The next question that you have to ask for is, as you pointed out, are there powers, are there exponents? For example, there are y1 square, y1 cube, or sine of y1, or e to the power y1, or even y1 times y2. If there are products of the unknowns, like here, okay, that will be called nonlinear. Okay, so this is a nonlinear differential equation. So there is no way you can solve it analytically. You need to use MATLAB or such tool to get the solution for that. How do I use MATLAB? The MATLAB function ODE45, which is what we used in the previous problem, is very powerful. It can handle any number of ordinary differential equations, not just one, even if you have hundred or thousand, it can handle. What you need to provide to ODE45 is a function that defines your problem. By that I mean, in this case, it has to return two function values f1 and f2. Okay, so the ODE45 must, it will make a call, and I will show you the tracing of how the call goes, how the transfer of control 
Are you comfortable with any programming language like um, basic or C or Fortran? Do you know what I mean by subroutine? How calls are transferred from one subroutine to another subroutine. Okay. So that is exactly what is happening here. I'm just making a call to ODE45. Say, say, ODE45 goes solving this problem. The problem is defined in this function. So ODE45 is going to call this function maybe 100,000 times. Each time it sends two values which is Y1 and Y2 in this particular case, and it expects two values back, which are F1 and F2. But F1 and F2 are nothing but the derivatives. So it's basically the slope. So if it knows the slope, MATLAB will then say, of OD45 will then say, if this is the slope, and if I take a small time step delta T, I can predict what the value will be at the next time step. And that's how OD45 finds the solution, constructs the solution to a specific accuracy. So to meet that accuracy, it will choose the delta t, the time step it takes. The smaller the time step, the more accurate you will result it. Okay? So what is happening here is, if you compare these two slides, here I have the model equation. Okay? And I'm writing that into a function. So the structure of a function is nothing but a subroutine, if you want to think of it like that. So the first keyword must be function, and then the output from the function the name of a function on the right hand side of the equal sign and a set of inputs. So the function will accept a set of inputs, follow certain rules to calculate the output and send the output back. So somewhere in your program, what you find here should match on the left hand side because that's what is assigned. So y dot equals something. Okay? So I'm sorry, I erased the other one. Uh, so what I'm doing in the first line of this function, I have to define what the function is. I'm saying k is equal to 3 when epsilon equals 1 over 98. These are two numbers in the problem that is given to you. Okay? And then y dot, you can call it anything you want. You can call it f1, you can call it y dot, but it must be an array. What MATLAB expects is to pass an array of input values in y and get an array output, which is the same length as the input. Okay? So um, I'm writing two lines. In the first line, if you compare term by term, it's basically the first equation that you see here. Minus y1 minus y2 times y1. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> uh, plus k epsilon times y2. Okay. So it is this one. It's exactly the same as the first equation that you see there. And the second equation, remember, the equation itself is given as epsilon times dy2 dt, but I need to move the epsilon to the right hand side. Okay? So what I have then is y1 minus y1 uh, times y2 minus epsilon times k times y2 divided by epsilon. The whole thing divided by epsilon. Okay? So I have defined this function, and I can test whether the function is working. How do I test this function? You have to save this again in a file. So here I call this file as ozone.m. Okay. So if you go to the MATLAB uh, environment, you will see there is a file called ozone.m uh, in my directory. And so if I type ozone zero comma one comma two, I would like you to explain what I'm doing now. No, no. T is, t is zero. The first variable is T. T is zero. And the array is of length two. So y1 will be one and y2 will be two. Okay? And taking these input values, MATLAB looks for what goes over. So in the current directory itself, it finds a function. So it just takes these values, passes it to ozone, and expects ozone to return some value. These are the two function values. Okay? Question. Yeah. Right, right. That, that's what I want you to do. Please ask me. If you see something there that you don't understand, you need to ask me why I have that. Okay. So, yeah. Can you guess? I'm building an array. Uh, yeah. Any? Yeah. 
These are not one of the conditions. These are the two functions in the problem, F1 and F2. Okay? So you could call this, for example, you could change this to F. What you call it really doesn't matter. But if you change it to F here, you need to go and change this to F. So that is F is the one that's going out of this function. Okay? But why did I put 1 comma 1 and 2 comma 1? Why didn't I put, for example, just this? This is a common mistake you will make. What would happen if I had it like this? It will, when it executes line 3, it will calculate F according to that rule. Then it goes to line 4, it rewrites F. So you lost the first value that you calculated, it rewrites it. So F is a placeholder. It's a variable, it's a pigeon box, it's a hole where you store numbers. Okay? F is a labeled place where you store numbers. So if you use the same variable, it overwrites it with the current value. So this is why you need to create an array in each location of the array you can store different values. So I could do this. Now I have stored two values in F1 and F2. Okay? And but what I'm doing is I now this is a vector. What is the difference between a vector and a ma uh, matrix in MATLAB? So again you go to MATLAB and for example I create A as equal to one comma two. That's a vector. It has two elements. Okay? Now if I say A equal to one two transpose what is that? That is also a vector, but the first one is a row vector, the second one is a column vector. So the transpose is an operator, the transpose is a row vector into a column vector. Okay? Now if I set this one, what is that? That's a matrix array. Okay? Two dimensional matrix array. And any column is the one that says end of the first row. And what comes after that is going to be second. Yeah. Do you actually type the comma or do you type space? There is, there is no comma. I just type space. I just type space. Well, you, what you are asking is can I do this? Yeah. Comma still separates. Comma or space is fine, but semicolon has special meaning. Semicolon says go to the next row. So I could uh, do this. What will it do? Yes, it adds a third row. Okay. So MATLAB is called a dynamic environment in the sense that the dimensioning of the array is dynamically determined, depending on how the entry is. For example, if I have, what, what will this produce? That's what you need to do. Be bold to guess what it is. Even if you are wrong, when you hit the return, you will understand how correct you were or how wrong you were. Okay? Don't be afraid to try this, and that's the best way to learn. Okay? So you preserve all the languages that you had defined before, and then here you are putting in a script entry. So you're creating a side by side, that means you're creating a side by side, and that entry you want six. But you have not set anything down. So it can change dynamically what is happening. Now let's go back to that problem and you explain to me what I'm trying to do in the function. What did I have? I had one comma one. I had two comma one. What am I doing? I'm creating a, a column vector. I'm creating a column vector. Now you can ask why. The answer to that is that's what ODE45 expects. If you don't do that, ODE45 will complain. If you return a row vector, ODE45 won't know what to do with it. So it expects a column vector. Yeah. This is a row vector. This is a row vector, ODE45 will complain. 
So if there are a couple of areas of fixing it, you can do, for example, this. Okay, so we create a row vector, then transpose it, and then send a column vector, or have it the way that I have this. Okay. So in every opportunity like that for me is to explain a lot of other things around it. So please keep the questions coming, okay? And that's how thing I can learn together. Now, what I'm going to show you next is how to trace how the transfer is controlled from MATLAB environment uh, to these functions. So the lines that you see here, okay, you can click on them and it sets something called a breakpoint. This is basically to trace how the flow occurs within MATLAB. Uh, I need to save this, that's why it's not, uh, okay. So once I save this, there's a copy in the disk, and then this shows you by a red dot. And so I'm now going to do this, execute the same function under debug control. Debugging is basically a way of tracing how the calculations proceed so that you can find if there is an error where the error is. So now I go to the MATLAB workspace, Oops, workspace. and I re-execute the same command that I did before. Ozone 0, 1, 2. Okay. Let's see what happens. So MATLAB previously went into this function, calculated the two numbers, and set it out. Right? You got two function values. Now it's not doing that. It's passing the control to Ozone, that function, and it's showing you a green arrow. And that's where the execution has stopped. Because I set this breakpoint there at line three, I said stop the execution, pass control back to me. I want to see what numbers came in. For example, what is the value of t that I sent? Do you remember it was zero, right? So if I take the cursor close to t, it will actually show you the value that this function got at this time. Next time, if you call it with one, it will have a value of one. What is the value of y? Just take the cursor close to it, take the value one and two. So y1 is going to be 1, y2 is going to be 2. So we can trace how the numbers are being passed from one subroutine to another subroutine, one function to another function, which is a very powerful feature. And if you take the close to k, of course, what do you have? 3. Now, we can also do this. We can go to the MATLAB workspace, and uh, you have this workspace variables on the right-hand side. There you see, okay? So there, k is defined with the value of 3. Epsilon is defined with the value of 1 over 98, which is executed that, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2. t is 0, y is 1, 1 and 2. So you can also look here to dynamically change this that location, the values of this function here. Okay? Now what I can do is I can trace the calculation one step at a time. Okay? I can say execute the next line number 3, and in order to do that, you need to go and look for these uh, small icons there. So step, say step through one line. So if you click that one, it has executed F1. Okay, that's calculate the value for F1. Let me ask you now, what would be the dimension of F at this stage? One by one, okay? So you can go to the workspace, and you will see that F is created with a single value. Okay? Then, Go back and execute the next line. Step one more time. Now F will be a vector, a row vector or a column vector? It will be a row vector. <laughs> okay? Because by definition, that's what, uh, if you just use one array, such step, it just creates a row vector. Okay? So it is one, two. Again, two. Uh, understand that you can always go and play here. The other thing I should point out is when you are in debug mode, normally the prompt here will be two angle characters. Okay? Then you can enter any command. But when it is in a debug control, it says case. That means there is some function waiting to be executed. That is return somewhere. Okay. So all the variables are now at that particular function sees. So if you just type y, it returns a row vector. And because that is why I passed it. I passed it as a row vector, 1, 2, right? And I'm assigning inside F1, F2, so it just treats it as a row vector. So the last statement then in the function will transpose it. So I execute one more time. Now the function will be a column vector, okay? So if I type F, uh, sorry, I should have typed F before, right? <laughs> F would be a column vector, okay, as you can see. 
And the last step would be to get out of the function. Because right now it says I'm a at the end of the function. Step one more. And it says I'm ready to go out of this function. Where does it go? Control is passed back to the workspace. Because I called it from the workspace. But if this function had been called from some other function, which would be an ODE45, for example, control will go back to ODE45. Then it will pick up to continue to do uh, other things. Okay? So now you can say, step out of it. I'm back into the workspace. And the K prompt goes away. Now MATLAB is ready to accept any command from you. Okay? So it gives you an idea of how the flow occurs within MATLAB. Any questions? That's all you need to do. So you need to write those two functions. Make sure that they are in uh, column vector form. And then use it with uh, ODE 4.5. Now let me show you how, when I integrate this, uh, how I get the solution. So I have the function ozone, which is defined. So I can type ODE 4.5. I need to tell what is the name of the function. So it's ozone. You always have the ampersand sign followed by the name of the M5, the function that contains it. Come on. The next argument to ODE 4 5 should be the span, time span, over what range you want to integrate. So I say I want to integrate from 0 to 5 in time. The next parameter should be the initial condition, and here, the number of initial conditions should match with the number of functions that you have, the dimension of the problem. If you have two ordinary differential equations, then you'll have to have two of them. So let me just say 0 and 1. So that's a row vector. That is a row vector. It doesn't have. Uh, Can it be either? Sorry? Can it be either column vector? Good, good question. Think about it. Can it be row or column vector? Look at the function. You should be able to answer that from the function. Why? The question is, can the initial condition that I sent for y be a row vector or a column vector? Anybody willing to venture a guess? <laughs> it can be a row or a column, I think. <laughs> we'll try it out. Why? Because all I'm saying, uh, when I'm addressing this, I'm simply saying y1. I, I'm not using two indices. I'm just saying y1. Whether it is a row vector or column vector, y1 will be the first element, y2 will be the second element in the row or the column. Okay? When I send it out, it is ODE 4, 5 that insists that it has to be a column vector. So I have to prepare the output to be a column vector, but the input can be either a row vector or a column vector. That's what I think, logically. Okay? Let's, let's try this out. I'm just going to leave it as a row vector. And uh, let me do one thing. Uh, let me remove. If I don't remove this, what do you think will happen? If I don't remove this debugging, and then I just enter, let's try that. So I call the OD45 okay, in the command line. Sorry, I need to keep switching back and forth. In the command line, I call OD45 pointing to the name of the function, the time span, and the initial condition. ODE45 calls ozone. So the control is now inside ozone, the function ozone, and it is stopping there because I set a breakpoint there. Okay? Now I can step through it if you like, but what you'll find is now the control is going to go back and it goes back to ODE45. This is the actual code for ODE45. If you want to ever look at it, you can look at the code for ODE45. Okay? So ODE45 is calling that function many, many times as it develops the solution. Okay? So you don't want to stop this every time, so let's just say continue. It comes back. Now ODE45 fits that thousand lines there. Finished all the statements, comes back with the next time value. So what do you think T will be? It will be interesting to see. T is 0.0013. So ODE45 has taken a small, tiny step from 0 to 0 0.0013. This is a nice case what are the function derivatives at this time so that I can project what the solution is going to be at the next time. <laughs> you get the idea now, right? So let's get rid of this and then continue. 
So I'll continue. <coughs> and uh, what do I get? <coughs> this is what I executed, right? OD, 4, 5, ozone. But I didn't store the results anywhere. So that was a mistake. Okay, so what I should have done is, I should have said, store the results in Ty equals. So whatever OD, 4, 5 returns should be stored in that particular value. Now I have the solution. I have two variables, output from OD equals 5. One is time, the other one is Y1 and Y2. So Y1 and Y2 is going to be actually a matrix. Okay, this is Y. So the first column tells you Y1, the second column gives you Y2. So Y1 and particular values are along this row that will correspond to a particular time. What time is it? You need to look at the other vector T. For example, if you want to look at, you can do this, T at uh, 25. What is the 25th entry in the T vector? That is time point 8292. At that time, what is the solution? <laughs> so we look at the Y vector. How would you do this? I want 25th row, all the columns. So this is how you address that. So you say, y is the large vector matrix, right? So I want the 25th row of every element in that particular row. Okay? And that's how I would pull out those two numbers. So at any time, I can find out the corresponding solution. Of course, the easiest way to do is plot t to my y. What is that going to do? So it's plot the graph for me. Oops, I made a mistake. I want to see what mistake can guess what I made. This is the graph it generates. What will happen? I left it on hold. So the premium graphs are there, and this graph is added, and this graph goes from 0 to 1. Right? So all the points are in on that scale. Okay? So I need to close this window and uh, then replot it. So I can just hit the up arrow. This is where the editing is useful. And replot it, and that's where you get the solution. There are actually two curves there. I don't know whether you can see them. One is here. I think I set y1 as equal to 0, right? That's why if I change this to 1 and 0. And the other thing that you can do, this is also very important when you're submitting your assignment. I don't want you to print out 200 lines with just the values. Okay. So if you put a semicolon at the end of a line, it suppresses the printing. It doesn't print those. But it calculates the value. T and Y are available in your workspace, but it's not just echoing. It's not printing on the screen. Now if I plot that, <coughs> I get uh, the two curves. Okay. Uh, good question. I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. You can control which one is which by saying plot t, uh, the first variable alone, t against the first variable alone. So this is going to be comma 1. So what does this do? It picks the first column, all the variables in the first column, and then you can assign a particular symbol. So the third argument is the symbol. Okay? And then you can say plot again t comma y comma 2, comma plus, something like this. Okay? So what it does is generate two graphs. First one is the first column is the symbol 4, second one is again T against Y2 with the symbol 1. Okay? <coughs> and the plot command is very powerful. There are many things that you can do. <coughs> uh, so use the help to learn on your own. There you see that. Okay. <coughs> and you can also do visually editing, uh, edit these axes, put labels, legends, everything. So if you go to tools and properties somewhere, uh, it will allow you to edit everything on the graph and then save it as an EPS file or print it out onto the printer. Uh, I'm going to let you kind of play with those things in your own, okay? <coughs> depending on your interest and the time you have to kill. Because this is a time sink. <laughs> 
Adam, any question? Did you have a question? Okay. Anybody else? Okay, the whole class turned out to be just a MATLAB <laughs> demonstration. <coughs> if no questions, then let's get back to the lecture. <coughs> okay. Uh, so we saw that there is always an offset between the set point and the final steady state temperature if you use only the proportional control. Okay. So uh, the next point I want to illustrate is in some cases you may not need a strong control action because the control action actually may worsen the performance of a particular system. So here is a scenario where there are disturbances, random disturbances in the inner temperature to the tank. And there are very large, for example, five degrees of dust in the temperature. But if the system has a large capacitance, okay, then you may not need a control action because the output will be automatically smoothed out. Any fluctuation in the inlet is automatically smoothed out by the large capacitance in the output variable. So the output variable may actually have show a much smaller variance. So here I'm showing the output temperature. With TR as being set point, and the fluctuation around that may be small. Now, when I make the statement because of large capacitance, it damps out. Do you understand what I mean by that, right? If you don't, you can just take a look at the equation, and the equation will tell you. What do I mean by the large capacitance? It's simply that rho V times C in the denominator. Either you have a large volume, or you have a large heat capacity, or the density is large. Whatever the combination is, the rho V C, the product is large then even though you may have a very large variation in Ti, the entire S function is divided by a large number. So S is going to be small. That means dt, the temperature changes with time, is going to be small. So large capacitance terms spontaneously dance without simply because you have a division by a large number. In those cases, you may not actually want a uh, very strong uh, control action. <coughs> Uh, the next one we said there is always an offset and to get rid of the offset we saw that we could add an integral action. Okay? So Q of T is a steady state plus a proportional action given by this plus an integral action. Okay? What does the integral action do? If for example once you get this is your uh, <laughs> set point TR and we saw that in the particular case the T goes like this. So there is an offset here. T never goes back to TR. That means there is always an error. But this term says I'll take the difference and integrate it, accumulate the error. And then there is a proportional action that is proportional to the accumulated error. Okay? And that control action will be stronger. To solve this, what are the problems? If I take this Q of T and put it into this equation, See, this is what I had previously. So now I need to add some kr times integral of the tr minus t. Oops, sorry. tr minus t. Okay. So it becomes a differential integral, a differential equation with an integral in that. Okay. So that's a pretty messy system to deal with. But we will see that Laplace transform will allow us to solve this very elegantly. So we will defer the solution of the integral action until we see Laplace transform. We'll review the Laplace transform very quickly. Okay? But when we do that, here you see the results of an integral action. So this is the R, okay? depending on the value of the integral constant. Again, that's another constant that you need to choose. Depending on the value of it, we can get, for example, uh, <coughs> KR1. <coughs> that's uh, the largest value, for example. You may get an action like this. Error is driven to zero. It alternates around it, but it's driven to zero. Okay. And if KR3 <coughs> is like this, the response may be like this. It depends on the system. Okay. But integral action, the point that I wanted to get at it, will get rid of the offset and will achieve the response that you need. <coughs> the other complications one must look at is the measuring instrument itself might have a delay. 
So we need to develop a dynamic model for the measuring instrument, which could be a thermocouple, for example. And the temperature may not be uniform in the tank. So the sensor location plays a problem too. The control performance ultimately will depend on these other factors also, not only on the dynamics of the process. Okay? And an aggressive control action, meaning very large value of KC, may make the system unstable. So the stability is another concept that we need to see in uh, greater detail later. Okay. So this is but qualitatively, this would be an unstable system where the temperature keeps on increasing with time under the action of a control system. So the control system responds very quickly and tries to use the predicted value from the model and it doesn't sink so that it just keeps on blowing up. <coughs> and there's a mathematical way of defining what stability is and looking at controller tuning to have a stable system. This is a block diagram representation of a complete control system for this particular process. The process is the stir tank and you should be able to develop this ability to represent a process diagram by superposing on it the control diagram. Okay? So our entire analysis centered around the stir tank with a certain input TI. Okay? And the output is measured by a sensor, thermocouple. So it takes temperature as a sensor but sends out the voltage as the output from the uh, thermocouple. And then you have a set point. So the set point again is a temperature but you have a calibration device that says if I want the set point to be 80 degrees, I should be getting a certain voltage VR. So the comparator compares the two signals. So the comparator should have the same units because it's going to add or subtract. And then it sends the error to the controller, which is the brain in this case, KC times CR minus T. And the controller then sends a signal to the heater, saying increase the heat or decrease the heat, okay, to try to bring it back to the set point. So this problem would be called a regulatory problem. There are two types of problems. One is a disturbance rejection problem, which is if the system is operating under steady state, any disturbance should be rejected. So you bring it back to the steady state. The other one is set point tracking. You want to change the condition, set point of the plant from one condition to another condition. We will see both problems, how to handle both of them. I guess I'm running out of time. Uh, feel free to come and see me if you have any difficulty with the assignment. Okay? Don't spend too much time debugging your program. Spending maybe the first half an hour, 45 minutes is helpful because you're learning a lot. After that, you don't know where the problem is. Talk to your neighbor, talk to friends, if not, come to me. Okay? Uh, so that there is a diminishing return in terms of uh, trying to debug a program. <coughs> All right. See you uh, next class.